Dear colleagues, good afternoon and welcome to a new episode of the AIR seminar sessions organized by ERA. Today, we have a special session organized by the European Renal Nutrition Working Group about how to implement low-protein diet, one of the cornerstones in the treatment of non-dialysis AKD patients. I'm Dr. Pablo Molina, a nephrologist from Valencia, Spain, and uh, I have with me today the wonderful Professor Claudia D'Alessandro, who is a renal dietitian who has been in practice for more than 20 years at the University of Pisa, Italy, with clinical research and teaching tasks. Her scientific research has been mainly carried out in the field of clinical nutrition to spread the principles of healthy nutrition in both general population and CKD patients. In addition to the speakers, we have an amazing lineup, and I am also delighted to introduce the two panelists, Lilian Kupari and Alice, and Alice Sabatino. Professor Kupari is a renal dietitian and affiliate professor of the Division of Nephrology at Federal University of Sao Paulo, Paulo Brazil, and uh, Alice Sabatino is also a renal dietitian from University of Parma, Italy, as well as a board member of the RN working group, which organized this e seminar. Currently, she's a postdoc researcher at Karolinska Institute in Sweden, author of the last, of the last ESPEN guidelines on clinical nutrition, and member of the working group for the joint ISRNM and ISPD practice recommendation on nutrition management in peritoneal dialysis patients. And uh, before we start, let me give to the audience two practical commentaries about how to activate a real-time translation of the presentation and how to obtain medical education credits. As you know, ERA is launching a real-time translation with artificial intelligence in seven languages, including French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. To enable the audio, please click on the globe icon at the bottom near the pulse function and choose your favorite language. For the captions, an external link to access through the browser will be provided within the chat. And uh, finally, as in previous ERA seminars, by participating live, you may earn one European credit for your continuous medical education. I remind you that this is an exclusive benefit for ERA members only, and for achieving the dip diploma, a team this must fill in the mandatory questionnaire feedback at the end of the e-seminar. I now call to Claudia D'Alessandro to speak about how to deal with the challenge of the low protein diet. Thank you, Claudia, when you wish. Hello, everybody. It's, it's uh, really a good pleasure to be here today. I thank uh, the EARN group for, and ERA for this invitation. Uh, this is my disclosure, according to ERA uh, suggestions. And okay, the topic of my uh, presentation is uh, to give practical information. So I tell you something about my daily clinical practice. And these are the, the points I will discuss during my presentation. I think the, um, how the renal dietitian approach uh, need to change to improve patient's adherence. Then I, as I prefer to talk about patients rather than diets, I'll show you some typical example of patient I find in my clinic. And then considering the, this typical patient example, I tell you some uh, clinical, give you some practical uh, advice that I used to give to my patients. So let's start with the first point. Um, 
as Dr. Molina told before, uh, I'm working with renal disease for 20, 25 years, and I see uh, that uh, CKD population has changed a lot over time. Our patients now are older, and there is greater prevalence of diabetes and cardiovascular comorbid conditions. The problem is that uh, elderly uh, don't feed themselves properly. Their ha dietary habits are repetitive. They sometimes live alone. There are nobody who go to shopping, who prepare food for them. So they use very often preserved meats or pre-cooked meals. Some of them have chewing problems or lack of appetite that sometimes is due also from the, uh, from, uh, due for the, uh, to the fact that they live alone. But in our CKD population, we also have young people where, who still who is working, who need energy. So uh, with this uh, change in population so various, uh, the typical dietary plan based only on the residual renal function, even if it is perfect and well calculated, is not enough to improve adherence to, to the diet. So we have guidelines who helps us to help uh, helps us to give the basis of the uh, the recommendation on what we can base our inter nutritional intervention. Uh, here we have the Doki guideline published in 2020, who talks about the use for the first time, the use of low protein diet and very low protein diet in the nutritional management of CKD patients. And we have recently the KDGO, which I, we, I have, they have been published just a few days ago, who, on the contrary, talk about the use of, um, of 0 0.8 uh, gram or kilogram of body weight protein. And we'll discuss about this different suggestion at the end of the presentation, even if the KD go tell that we can use low protein diet for those, those patients who are at risk of kidney, of kidney failure. But um, obviously the, K, the guideline give information uh, and general recommendation that we have to contextualize in our clinical setting. So, what can we do with patients to improve adherence? What I think that what, what can we do is to start the, our approach from the patient and work with the patients because uh, such, uh, recommendations should be personalized. This is the typical path that a renal dietist and generally follow. So starting from ne the nephrologist that had the dietary prescription. And uh, as you uh, can see, I highlight this, this second step, dietary recall. Dietary recall, I think, is a very strong tool in the dietitian toolkit because when we ask patients their dietary habits, we don't know, we don't have only information about what they eat, but we have, we, I always say we enter patient home. We have information about lifestyle, social life, who goes to, to go, who do shopping, who prefers a food so we can understand more than food. And so we gain important information to implement our uh, and uh, personalized and targeted intervention. So starting from clinical data, as the evaluation of nutritional status and dietary habits, we can start our intervention. So um, let's see uh, how, what are the typical patients we can meet or I can meet in my, in my clinic? I have patients who comes to my clinic with good blood tests, with the current diet. So when then we discuss or how I manage this patient. But I also have patients with a low food intake, so at high risk of undernourishment. Then I have also patients who already follow or should follow a dietary prescription, but exams are not good, so they need 
the adherence is not good. So we have to uh, make to perform a specific and targeted intervention. Let's start with the first case, patient with good dietary habits. So what can we do with this kind of patient? We don't change dietary habits, even if they don't follow, they don't follow a specific diet. So what we start with blood test, we start from the uh, dietary recall, and what I generally do is to reinforce the principle of healthy eating habits. So we try so to suggest the best choices, and generally I summarize these best choices in five tips. I uh, show here, so to limit salt use while cooking, and in particular to limit food rich in salt like cuts, sausages, cheeses, or canned or preserved foods. I suggest also to have the second course only once a day. Why? Because we have to control protein intake. In this case, we try to uh, avoid that patient exaggerate with protein intake. So to uh, uh, having the second course once a day, it's easier to obtain this goal. I suggest them to have fruit and vegetables because at, at least uh, to Self for, for serving a day from uh, considering both fruits and vegetables. Why? Because they are rich in fiber and they have a very alkali an hyper alkalizing power. We suggest also to use pulses instead of meat, pulses or legumes, instead of meat, fish, and to have them together with grains. This is a perfect combination to use, uh, to have an eye. Uh, an, an adequate uh, intake of protein, but of plant origin. And we know that the protein of plant origin have a different effect, a protective effect on, on, the, on the kidney. And then they are also, are also rich in fiber. And so this is an ad, um, an ad positive effect. And we also, uh, for the patients who comes to the clinic for the first time, we don't, we don't immediately start with a low protein diet, but we start um, giving the information about an healthy diet and we start for the Mediterranean dietary diet. And uh, we also try to adapt more the Mediterranean diet to CKD passion. So, I summarize this concept in this table. I'm sorry, the, it's very it's too small, but in the same, in the first column, we, uh, we listed all the, the most important food or food group of the Mediterranean diet. Here we have our frequency of consumption in the Mediterranean diet. And here in the third column, what this, the changes we suggest to adapt the Mediterranean diet to, uh, to our patients. We work on the quality of the diet, but we also try to um, not to limit too much. So there is, uh, there is not a perfect food, but also uh, an awful food. So for those food who are not so, so, uh, useful for our patient, what we try to do is to work with the frequency of consumption and the serving side, but uh, and not only to not only to limit them, just to uh, increase the adherence of our prescription. You know, in Italy we have protein-free products, but in this first phase. Uh, when we start with healthy diet, we don't generally we don't use this product, even if they are a very important source of green energy for CKD patients because they don't produce waste products. So we use them only in some particular condi condition, this first phase, when we need to increase energy. Because obviously, if, for example, if we have young patients or 
patients who do physical activity, so needing energy, they need more energy. But if we increase the amount of food, the risk is to increase also the uh, intake of protein. So in these cases, the use of uh, of low or free protein free products is very important to give uh, green energy. But what happened with patients with a low food intake, so at risk of undernourishment? Obviously, we cannot tell them eat more because they are not able. So we have to help them to increase the energy density. So small amounts of food with high energy content, small amounts, small volume, because they feel immediately uh, full. And in these cases, for example, we use protein-free products as a source of energy. Obviously, we provide them advice on how to prepare them to be more pleasant. We you I try to increase the use of high energy food such as olive oil. That's also uh, olive oil also improve the taste. It is very important. Or sometimes even sugar or jam if there is no diabetes because we need to increase calories. Or vegetable products like vegetable cheese, rice cheese for example, we have in our preparation to increase energy. And when I'm not able to use, to uh, increase energy with food, I use specific supplements. I prefer unflavored powder supplements that I can add to food without changing the taste, but we can also use oral supplements. Sometimes with people who doesn't eat enough, we need to add protein instead of reducing. Or so we can, if we are not able to reach this goal with food, with common food, with regular food, we can use supplements, for example, essential amino acid and keto acids to obtain an adequate intake of, of protein. And here I start with my practical advice. We, I, I, I would like to show you how we can play with food to create effective um, recipes, effective meal. For example, here we have a simple slice of bread and that where we can add oil, for, for example, to improve taste and, and energy. We can have vegetables to improve the, to uh, the increase the amount of fiber and to let um, be, uh, to let them more pleasant also to see. And bath we can change ingredients and uh, look at how the composition of the small, the small slice of bread can change, only change it ingredients. If we have patients who don't have enough protein, we can add, for example, white uh, uh, egg white, that, and we can add uh, slices of ham, a uh, look at protein and calories, how change. So we can play with food, creating a please, pleasant recipe and increasing the uh, adherence to the diet. And here, the more difficult kind of patient, patient who has already received, has already received a dietary prescription, but the adherence is not good. And so he, ha he has or she has a, bl a bad blood test. What can we do? We cannot, with this kind of passion, we cannot repeat again the usual, recommend, the usual recommendation because they already had had help. So what can we do in this case? We can start with a targeted intervention. And here we can use a special uh, specific uh, tool, education tool, but what I prefer is to you is to work with recipe. I use uh, um, recipe as educational tool for personalized counseling. And generally, I use the list of ingredients to substitute those food that, who are not, that are not useful for our passion with more uh, useful ones. And I use the preparation notes to teach patient how they can manage food. For example, to reduce potassium, I told them or write them to clean, wash, cut vegetables into pieces and 
could boil them in plenty of fresh water and then discharge the cooking water. And I repeat this sentence in the preparation note so that patients understand and how they can manage their data, their diet, and so they can continue to do it by themselves. And here are some examples for of a recipe that, for example, we use. This is a recipe on with the use of protein-free pasta. Protein-free pasta uh, is uh, something like um, as um, it's very similar to gluten-free products. So we. If they are not the taste and the cooking and the um, preparation need, the taste is not to see similar to that, to regular pasta. So we have to give a suggestion on how to prepare it. So for example, we, help, we tell patient to cook pasta into directly in the sauce. So they have, the taste improves a lot. And for example, to reduce salt, we teach them to use herbs and spices to to change to uh, to change the taste, which to let them prove a taste different for, for, from that given by salt. And here are a typical uh, vegan recipe with the use of lentils, so legumes. And, 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 and grain, in this case, it is rice. For example, in this case, we gave suggestion uh, on, uh, on boiling, to, to use boiling, for example, to uh, reduce potassium content. But also it is used, as regard legumes, we have to remember that sometimes patients use dry, uh, dry legumes and we suggest them to soak them. The problem is that when they soak legumes, they activate phytasis, because generally we tell that uh, phosphorus from, uh, from vegetable is less absorbable. But in this case, when you soak the legumes and activate phytasis, the phosphate become absorbable. But if patients boil them, phytate, Phosphorus is eliminated with the cooking water. So the, we give all these useful suggestions. And these are another uh, vegan, uh, vegan recipe. As you understand, uh, we use a lot of vegan diet and, and plant-based protein. And for example, our patients are worried about eating potato, but if they boil them, they can have it. So all these uh, practical advices can also um, uh, make patients more um, prone to, uh, to accept our recommendation. Here, for example, another recipe for patients with chewing problems. My patients, my old patient doesn't have meat. And while it is very important not to reduce, because we use low protein, but we, we have but uh, sometimes for patients, it's important to have a small am am amount of protein with, uh, with uh, protein of high bi biological value. But patients with chewing problems are not able to have it. So here we try, we give information so how to have also uh, meat with this modification. And this recipe, for example, is very useful also for patients on dialysis because we suggest to boil meat and we know that boiling meat helps to reduce phosphate content. We also use, as I told you before, the um, an alternation, and we alternate a low pro, standard low protein with protein free products, which is based on the use of protein free products and a small amount, a precise amount of meat and fish. And we alternate it with a vegan diet based on the use of the combination of grain and of cereal, grains, and legumes. This is a very interesting. Um, uh, the, many, the dietetic manipulation because patients are very, when we use this combination, patients' adherence increase a lot. And, but we can do more with recipe. 
look, we can also, for example, calculate the potential renal acid load of a diet. We know how in the, that acid, metabolic acidosis is one of the clinical complications of renal disease. And we can play with food, creating recipe which are able to, um, to with an high alkalizing power. So uh, alkalizing power, if you have uh, negative values, the effect of a food or an recipes is alkalizing. If you have a positive value, the effect is acidifying. For example, the uh, potential renal acid load for, of a um, uh, common Western diet is plus 53. So very acidifying. But Look at these two recipe. It's the same recipe. We also change one ingredient and look at the potential renal acid load. It becomes only changing one ingredient, it becomes very alkalizing. So this is just an example of how we can work, we can play with food to not only to, to improve patient's adherence, but to obtain important metabolic effect. Follow-up is another important uh, step of the nutritional intervention. And uh, because it, gu it, uh, it guides our intervention, it tells us, it, it, um, we can, with the nutritional intervention, we can understand if what we are doing is good or not and what we have to change. And it is very important also because uh, patient, when we do all these functional tests or all the measurement, patient feel uh, happy because they are uh, away. They, they uh, tell us uh, how if uh, the that with this um, uh, all these analysis they can understand if what they are doing is good or not. And sometimes my patients ask me how we can, we can repeat all this measurement to, to understand if I improve my condition or not. So it is very important. And uh, as I told you before, I, I prefer to, to talk about passion rather than diet, uh, because I think there is not a perfect diet. Uh, in 2016, BMC Nephrology published uh, many papers uh, talking about the nutritional approach to CKD patient. And many countries uh, published their experience. And if you read them, there's the uh, nutritional approach are, are quite different, but the, we cannot say that one is better from the other. They are different because patients are different, because patients have different tradition and culture. So what is important, I think, is start from the patient and adapt nutritional intervention to uh, his habits or her habits. So to conclude, dietary therapies, I think, is an important therapeutic option in patients with CKD, especially with a new population of CKD patients. We have to start from the patient and work with the patient and ease her family and also caregiver because they are very important for the implementation of the dietary therapy. We have to give solutions instead of prohibitions and to help patients to create a new eating style. And we have also have to help patients to play the main role in their own care. But we don't have also only to play to talk about diet. I think that we have to let them remember that there is more than food. I think that, for example, physical activity is very important to help patients feeling well. And if patients feel well, is more um, uh, prone to follow our suggestion and to improve their quality of life. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Claudia, for your excellent presentation. And uh, I invite Alice or, and Lillian to comment on this issue, please. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. It's very good to see dietitians working in, in action. <laughs> 
fellow okay. dietitians in action and individualizing and thinking about the patient, not thinking about numbers and prescriptions. Because yeah. I think that we always need to look at the big picture. We have beautiful guidelines and recommendations, but we have patients in front of us. And yeah. so sometimes we cannot start giving 0 0.6 grams of protein to a patient that's been eating 1.5. Yeah. We need to do a stepwise approach. Yeah. And you said many yes. times, personalize a targeted intervention. And that's yeah. what we need to do. That's the difference between yes. only giving a diet and actually being a dietitian working with patient, right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, because sometimes when uh, I remember when I start my work as a dietitian, I was worried about the diet to calculate the diet uh, in the right way. Uh, but now I realize that the diet is not important. It's what the interaction, the communication, the relationship you make with your patients that is very important. Obviously, we have to give suggestion or but of healthy diet, but it is very important today also to give very practical information about also how to do uh, shopping, how to buy food. Today is very important. Sometimes patients, especially old patients, arrived in my clinic with a box. Or oh, may I hit this? Or and generally they use uh, already um, uh, pre-cooked food. Yes. Uh, and yes, because they are ready to eat. And this is a, a very important problem today. I do, you have any, do you have patients that ask for you for calculated diets? Because I do. They ask me for oh, yeah. weekly menus and calculated diets, they ask. Yes, they also, yes, because they, they think if they have a scheduled plan every day, but then they realize that it's not so easy because you, uh, you, we have also to follow our desire. Today I need this, to the, uh, the other day I need something else. So, and I prefer to help them to manage their diet. Sometimes I tell them, I give you a dietary plan just uh, uh, because you, uh, is, uh, in order to help you to go to do shopping and to buy the right food. Yes. But not to, yes, yes. We teach them how to, okay, here's an example, yes. but yes. this is how you need to replace because you don't need to have exactly yes. these foods on Mondays. Yes. I have a curiosity about the rice cheese. Do you give them some recipe or do you yes. tell them to buy from the yes. shop? Yes. Because I give the rice. ones are ultra processed, right? The ones that you buy. Yes, yes. But we, you, you know, we... Uh, Two years ago, we analyzed more than 500 of uh, vegan vegetarian products because we realized that they are no so healthy. They are full of salt, full of preservative, and, and they are full. Uh, they are so uh, not. But I use in generally vegetable drinks and rice, cheese, and uh, sometimes also vegetable yogurt because it's low protein. Yeah. And this, the, 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 um, sorry, the, um, this cheese are rich in salt, but they, sometimes they have uh, no preservatives. So we, I try to, ch to choose the less, um, the more safe, okay? Okay, so and the, I you give don't recipe. give a recipe for them to prepare. Yeah. No, no, I home. give also recipe. Yes, I, also, I give I recipe, also yes. yes, 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 I give it recipe. I also try to do rice cheese and soya cheese by myself at home. Yes, because I, um, as you see in the slide, I have, I, I, I think my kitchen has become in a lab. Yes, where I try to make experiments with food. Yeah, I do the same. This is in my bucket list to do the rice cheese at home to see if yeah. it's... Yeah, yes. Okay, I'll give you the recipe. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. I pass the, the, the floor to Lillian Kupari. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here and uh, to hear from you, Claudia, 
so many excellent advices and uh, and tips and uh, how you deal with uh, your patients and uh, nice. i completely agree with you that we have to change the way uh, sometimes the, the the more traditional way to to give advice for our patients and uh, i'm so glad to hear that you you do together with the patient and uh, that's what I, I i i try to do with the patients to to listen to the patient what are their habits uh, food habits and then uh, to decide together with him uh, for example when they say i like to eat this or that and then I say, for example, well, this is, uh, what about the, the portion? Could we change? And how do you think it's the best way to change this? And so he, 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 he tells me how he can, uh, he can change. And um, uh, you, you told us about this uh, protein-free pasta, pasta that you have in Italy. Uh, yeah. We don't have this in many countries. Um, and sometimes I think that your eating habits in Italy, uh, it's with a lot of pasta and bread, yeah. that it's not the same everywhere. And yeah. for example, here in Brazil, we have this uh, eating uh, habit of eating rice and beans. Yeah. And that is a very good mixture uh, because the amino acids of beans uh, uh, complement the, the what is lacking in the in the rice, and uh, I, I I'd like to share with you my experience with this because we uh, we used to calculate or we used to restrict beans from our patients because of the amount of protein, even it's a vegetable protein, but the total amount. And when we decided to analyze uh, the quality of the diet and what we were doing with our patients, we were uh, very uh, surprised because the quality of the diet was worse and they, they decreased the intake of beans. That is a very good uh, food with a number of nutrients, fiber and etc. So then we started not saying anything about uh, uh, li limiting the yes. the, the beans. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, an another point that you 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 mentioned is about the vegan or the vegetarian diet. Uh, and I, I sometimes the patient is afraid that if they don't eat uh, animal foods. Mm -hmm. They, they will lose body proteins and so on. And uh, do you think there is a need, for example, to supplement such a, a vegan diet with uh, amino acids or keto yeah. acids? Yes, I think just to, because obviously we uh, not to have um, to have all the essential amino acid, we can combine uh, protein from grains and protein from legumes but to more to have more for a more safe diet the to have uh, and the supplementation with amino acid essential amino acid keto, keto acid i think could be um, useful and uh, we can do it not in the same way we do with the very low protein diet. In the very low protein diet, we give once one pills generally uh, every four, five uh, kilos kilos of body weight. In the case of a vegan diet, we can use less. Uh, for example, one pill every ten kilos. So we don't need such a, such a supplement, a great supplementation. But I think for it could be uh, more useful to be more sure that to maintain a good nutritional status. And, and what uh, is important uh, is also to say patients that muscle are not 
uh, we can um, protect our muscle during the physical activity because you have a lot of protein, but if we don't move, um, we lose muscle in the same way. That, that, that's exactly what I think, because here, at least here in Brazil, everything is high in protein. The yogurt has more so protein. Eat it, yes. And as if we, we just eating protein, we are going to grow our yes. muscles. This is not yes. true, we know. Yes. And uh, just just going back, do you think in this vegan uh, diet we should, for example, supplement uh, vitamin B12 or iron? What do you yes, think about because, uh, Yes, it, it depends on how long we do, patients do this diet, diet because we have, um, we have vitamin, we, we have vitamin uh, B, B12, but we we don't we if we don't have animal uh, source uh, sorry food of animal origin uh, we can uh, have um, with vitamin B12 can can lack and the same for iron because the best source of iron iron is meat so if we don't have meat uh, iron, which is in vegetable, is not is not absorbable. It's not uh, from uh, bioavailable. So probably, if we follow a vegan diet for a long time, uh, we need to supplement both vitamin and sometimes I think it, it, we have to supplement also calcium. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this, Even this if, lab should be monitoring. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even if today we have, uh, for example, vegetable drinks enriched with calcium. So it depends mm -hmm. on the food choices. Okay. And uh, just one point that I think everybody's and and there is some questions here. Um, do you think that now with this new medication that we know that decrease the uh, hyperfiltration or has this impact in uh, for the patients, the low protein diet it's not more necessary. So uh, we can we we should give them to everybody to eat the amount of protein they want. What do you think about what your I thoughts about it? Yeah, I think that I'm a dietitian, uh, so I'll never tell that that low protein diet cannot be used. No, I I'm joking. I think that these new drugs are a great opportunity, a great chance for patients. But what we can obtain from um, low protein diet or also an healthy diet is something more, because uh, with we use low protein diet to reduce clinical symptoms. So, and from a good, uh, this diet, we reduce uh, intoxication. Our um, mac microbiota micro uh, gut uh, microbiota feel better. So we, from the diet, we gain, we have a lot of uh, positive effect. So I think we can uh, use uh, these drugs together with the diet. So with a synergistic effect, one don't reduce the importance of the other. Probably they are useful, for example, if we, talk, uh, we think about the use of the new um, drugs to lower potassium or um, SGL inhibitor, they are uh, they let us to to have to have a more um, to to let pe to help patient to be more free, for example, to use vegetables. So this is a very important thing because they have more fiber. We uh, we uh, tell before that we have vegetables are an alkalizing power. So, but we think we have it's another tool we have. So they have to work together. I think. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think Dr. Molina. Thank you very much. I, I have some questions. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, from the audience. And the uh, first one is about 
quantity uh, as opposite to quality of proteins. We have many evidence about the point recommended, the amount of proteins, but when you uh, fix that uh, target of protein quantity, do you think that maybe it's not the same if you are using protein source, uh, meat source proteins instead uh, vegetables? I mean, uh, maybe the availability for uh, meat is higher. So when you measure it in the dish, maybe it's different. So do you have any evidence or recommendation about this? Okay, about the use of quantity of the same quantity of animal proteins or vegetable proteins. Okay, there is a, an old study uh, which showed the effect of the use of animal protein and vegetable protein on proteinuria. And uh, the studies show that if it, you, we use uh, an high amount of casein, 24%, uh, and we reduce it at to 12%, proteinuria decreases a lot. When we change the quality of protein from casein to soya protein, using the same amount, 24%, proteinuria was, uh, mm, uh, it decreases a lot. So um, I think we have to educate patients to give an amount because we cannot, let, because obviously uh, it is very important to uh, educate patients to write the right amount. But I think that the effect of protein but from vegetable and animal origin is very uh, interesting. So animal protein, uh, with the, the amount of, we have to pay more attention to the amount of animal protein rather than vegetable protein. And uh, we know that um, and, um, animal protein are less, uh, are better absorbable rather than uh, vegetable protein. So sometimes we can also use more vegetable protein just because they are less absorbed because, because our uh, intestine, uh, this, uh, our cap absorption, uh, absorption capacity is, um, uh, this is a law in biology that says that we are able to absorb what is similar to us. So we are more able to absorb uh, animal protein rather than vegetable protein. Thank you. Uh, other question I think it's important is uh, when to start with low protein diet. At what CKD stage you recommend to start? Okay. Uh, yes, there are, uh, there is a, a consensus of Aparicio that uh, define when started the low protein diet. Uh, so according to the renal function stage, renal stage. But uh, what I generally do in my clinical practice is uh, to look at the patient and in particular to clinical data. So blood tests. So generally we start, we if uh, the patient come, uh, when a patient comes to our clinic, we start with eating with uh, healthy eating habits, to uh, educating them to healthy eating habits, and then when we start, when we, we try to restrict protein, when with uh, the healthy habits, we are not able to obtain a good metabolic control. So when the urea start. Uh, increasing uh, and from urinary urea, we see that patient is following a zero, for example, 0 0.8 diet, but with this diet is not able to obtain a good metabolic control because urea, serum urea increases. So we start to decrease protein take. So we do, we generally, we use a gradual approach. So we decrease protein take 
and we check serum urea. When serum urea, just to have to, um, what we do is to uh, reduce protein take according to blood test to the clinic, okay. rather than according to the stage of renal disease. Okay, thank you. Other uh, issues about uh, maybe elderly patients, because you know that uh, uh, all patients with CKD, we should reduce protein uh, intake. But on the other hand, um, you know that uh, for gen uh, all people in general population recommend a, a high protein intake. So what do you recommend in these cases of all patients with CKD non-dialysis? Okay. Uh, the problem with all patients, I think that we, uh, we don't need to increase protein in all patients because they are old. We have to understand if they have enough protein or not. Okay. I have patients who don't need to increase <laughs> protein take. The problem is that uh, with age, obviously, we have um, also uh, the, um, uh, the nutritional status. Uh, there is a loss of muscle of muscle mass, and but it's not the the solution is not only giving more protein, is to combine protein with physical activity, because even we feel give a lot of protein to our patients, old patient, they, it, it, this is not, uh, uh, the, the, the result is not that they use to do muscle. So what we have to check is that patient, old patient have the adequate protein take. So with all people with CKD, we pay attention Obviously, we evaluate nutritional status, we, uh, we saw if they are sarcopenic or not, and in that cases, we adjust protein intake to, uh, um, to, gain, to, to gain, okay, to avoid malnutrition. But I think it is very important to evaluate the, the patients, because sometimes I have old patients who doesn't have need to, to have more protein because they feel well. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, another interesting question from the audience is about uh, protein intake for patients uh, with uh, significant proteinuria. Do you think okay. if in these cases you have to compensate for your ur urinary loss of okay. proteins? Yes, generally what I do is uh, that, okay, so if the patient have proteinuria with a normal renal function, generally I use a, a normal protein diet and I supplement the amount of protein loose in the urine. Okay, and, but if they have a reduced um, renal function and is following, so a, a, re a reduced renal function, um, mm -hmm. I use a low protein diet, and then I supplement the amount of protein they are losing. Because if you have proteinuria and you give too much protein with the aim of, uh, of um, covering what they are losing, the risk is that we, uh, pro we, ca we cause hyperfiltration and the patient lose more protein. So I think what is the best is to uh, adapt the diet according to renal function and then to supplement what they are losing, the amount of protein losing. In PISA, uh, we use, when I start working in PISA, they use a vegan diet just to uh, use the protective effect of, low, of uh, plant, uh, protein of plant origin that causes less hyperfiltration uh, and a vegan diet supplemented with uh, amino acid and keto and essential amino acid and keto acid. An amount of uh, this supplement to corresponding to the amount of protein lost in the urine. 
Okay, thank you. Um, there are more questions. For example, uh, a quick question is about uh, dairy products. Uh, do you re there are? It seems that there are countries in which dairy products are very important in the diet. So in these cases, what dairy do you... products? Sorry, yes, I don't understand. Dairy, dairy products, milk, okay. milk products. Yes. So in these cases, uh, which milk product do you think is better for CKD patients? Okay, the problem of okay the um, the problem of dairy products is not protein. I say I think, but because we can manage the amount and so uh, give the right amount of protein. The problem is phosphate, and because uh, one hundred of milliliter of of milk contain ninety four milligram of phosphate is, is a, a big amount. And the other problem is salt, obviously, as regards hard cheese. So generally, when I started working with renal disease, I avoid milk products and dairy. My patient ate me, ate me. And, but with time, with time, I learned how to manage uh, dairy. Then generally, I use milk, yogurt, in conservative therapy. And sometimes if patients are have a good adherence, I use a little amount of parmesan on pasta. But if patient is very, very <laughs> adherent. And and the problem is on dialysis. Dialysis is, is, is hard to use the reproduce because of phosphate and obviously of salt. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for the last question, I think. Uh, it's very interesting and maybe a nasty question because if you have in non-dialysis AKD uh, malnourished patients, what do you prefer as a supplement? Ketoanalogs, high protein uh, supplement or low protein supplement? Uh, no, low pro, if uh, we have a patient with uh, bad, with a, not a good nutritional status, I don't use a uh, low protein uh, supplement. Generally, we use high protein. In the, the diet, the diet in the uh, recommendation are for an high protein, uh, about high protein from one to one to point two grams uh, of protein per kilo. So if we have a patient who doesn't reach this uh, recommendation, we have to increase protein. And the problem is that if we uh, increase protein with food, the risk is to give a lot of phosphate. Even if, if we have a patient with, who does not eat enough, generally uh, he doesn't have high level of phosphate. Generally, those who are malnourished have, have low phosphate level. So uh, what I prefer is I, I use uh, generally egg white as supplement. And it is, 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 is uh, very interesting as a supplement because it has high protein with high biological value and not, uh, not no phosphate. So I put egg white everywhere. And but uh, we can also use, uh, it's very interesting at the, the opportunity to use essential amino acid and keto acid because um, I don't remember the, if it is off label or not, but I think if we can, we have patients with a low protein take, we can use them. And the problem is in the dialysis, the use of water because patients are uh, thirsty and they, they want to use water to drink and not to take pills. <laughs> so this is a practical problem we have, but I think it, it could, could be interesting to use keto acid and essential amino acid to supplement and to give an, an adequate amount of protein. And we can also use, there are a lot of supplement, high protein supplement for a patient on dialysis. And the problem is to pay attention uh, on uh, when they have this supplement. For example, oral supplement, 
uh, because if they have them near the meal, the risk is that they don't have the meal. So we have to manage this supplement in uh, uh, pain attention. Okay, thank you. So this is a fascinating discussion, but I am afraid that time is running out. And I think this is a good point to end, uh, to end the discussion. It only remains for me to give a brief summary on the, the session. We know that low protein diets is one of the main treatments on CKD patients, but a dietary planning can be challenging for patients, healthcare professionals and caregivers. And uh, as Claudia stated, the main concern of the renal diets has turned from efficacy to feasibility. So rather than a structured dietary plan, a stepwise approach with a list of basic recommendations to improve adherence uh, may uh, allow patients to reach the protein target. It is also important to work with the patients. We can offer the low protein diet as part of an integrated menu in which patients can choose their own diet that best suits their preferences and clinical needs. Lastly, to allow efficacy and safety, the importance of monitoring and follow-up uh, has been emphasized. I think it has been an extremely interesting session with excellent comments and discussion. I am really grateful for the speaker and the two panelists. Thank you very much also to the audience for all contribution, your attention and discussion. And I really hope to see you all you soon. Thank you very much.